Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward pandemic planet, which is full of struggle and confusion and a lot of work trying to make progress um, in a very difficult time. The great pause, some people are calling it after our great acceleration we've had as a species for a couple of generations, three generations or more. Um, today's session, every Friday, we look at kind of the media and communication challenges around COVID-19 and general pathways to resilience. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the World Health Organization had a very useful conclave online the last couple of weeks on infodemiology. Is a new field needed? There's a lot of people digging in on how do you convey rational, uh, support rational decision making in, in a media environment that's so full of noise and disinformation. And today it'll be, uh, we'll hear from Liz Wilhelm, who's at the Centers for Disease Control, but was also in a uh, one of the designers of this infodemiology meeting, uh, Marin McKenna, who's a great uh, health-focused journalist with a, who's written about everything from the manufactured chicken that we all rely on to tons of articles on aspects of the pandemic and where do we go from here. Carl Bergstrom, who teaches uh, what I think of as a really a course that everyone should take at the University of Washington with his uh, co co co-teacher um, and founder of that, uh, uh, Jevin West. And the course is called Calling Bullshit in a Data-Fueled World. Uh, he has a book coming out. You'll hear about that too. Um, we're going to start with this concept of infodemiology. And I've done, I don't know, four or five sessions on here um, focused on how do you get communication impact in a world where culture and fear and all kinds of issues put filters in our heads. And we're not all seeing the same picture at any one time. I was struck when Don McNeil did a piece for the New York Times and my old friends there a week ago where he poked back at the uh, 1918 as the epidemic swept uh, uh, San Francisco. There was an anti-mask league. 4,000 people were members. It got a lot of press, as you can see here, sanitary Spartacans. Um, and um, you think, OK, well, aren't we beyond that? But just last week um, in the uh, Times of the Sunday Times of London, uh, Camilla Long, a a provocative columnist who's mostly focused on the arts. She wrote this piece, Lighten Up Face, Ma Face Mask Nazis. I was having my nails done, not filing my way out of jail. There's a whole backstory to this that's extraordinary. Twitter pulled her tweet about it, um, but the Times of London, which is a Murdoch paper, did not pull the story or you know lighten up on its use of the word Nazi. And uh, I mean, we're not going to dwell on that because... I could get further my rage for a long time to come. So I'm Andy Revkin. I'm at the Earth Institute of Columbia University, although, of course, I'm in the Hudson Valley in my house, uh, 50 miles north of the city. And it's great to have this conversation underway today. So first, I'm going to ask you each, how are you doing? Marin, you're at the top of my little column here. Um, I, I've started to think of where we are right now as sort of the end of the beginning. Uh, trying to figure out how to climb down from uh, an emergency posture and figure out what a reasonable pace is for what seems like the rest of our lives. I'm not doing a very good job with that calculation, so check back with me. There was a book published 15 years ago called The Long Emergency. It, it, the, author made a lot of <laughs> the author made a lot of mistakes. It was about the end of oil, but the concept of a long emergency is something I think we all have to get, have to normalize. Um, Carl, we're, we, we'll get to list in a second because she'll introduce the theme. But Carl, how are you doing out in the University of Washington at the Center for an Informed Public? Yeah, right. It's uh, unfortunately, you know, we had the center that uh, we launched in, in November and we had all of these exciting things lined up to to do. And so we've had to transition to uh, to, to digital but um, and online. But um, yeah, doing, you know, doing OK. Same as same as everybody else, I think, uh, you know, woke up this morning and was thinking, you know, just, just thinking about, boy, it just feels like it was a decade ago that, that uh, uh, all of this was starting. Yeah. And it's not really, well, you could count the starting date, but it's about six months or less into yeah. this yeah. profound uh, asteroid strike. So let's get to um, the theme today. Again, fresh paths to infodemic immunity. <laughs> How much of this is about immunizing the uh, audience, having, giving us capacity to understand things better, sort of Carl's course, calling bullshit, uh, having that ability and motivation in ourselves. And how much of it is about telling a better story or being or the, the storytelling, the story making, the uh, information providing 
Um, so Liz, if you could take us through a little bit of the thinking of the conference that took place, I'll show the slides that you provided and you know, just a quick review would be a great start. Sure. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Wilhelm. I'm a health communication specialist and I work on a team of behavioral scientists. And so we're really all about um, supporting uh, uptake uh, of vaccines around the world, especially in low and middle income countries. And um, issues around vaccine hesitancy, acceptance and demand are not just a problem in the U.S. They're a problem in many countries. And um, we know that for every child that's not vaccinated, it can create an immunity gap that can spur outbreaks. Um, and right now we're not just living in a pandemic but there's also many, many children who are missing out on vaccines because they've right. stopped immunization services and programs. So for us, it was doubly important to work with WHO on pulling off this conference. And what we have done as a team is support uh, the WHO um, infodemic unit, um, they call themselves the quantification unit, to stage a conference where we really wanted to bring together the coolest scientists we can find from around the world from many, many dif disciplines to pull together a conference where we try to define the field of infodemiology. On February 15th, Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO, the director general, had made a speech at the Munich Security Conference where he said, we're not just fighting a pandemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And an infodemic it can be defined as an overabundance of information, including misinformation uh, accompanying an outbreak. And as you can see from this uh, lovely epi curve that you see here, there's a lot that we can borrow from epidemiology and how we talk about public health uh, surveillance and response to outbreaks um, that can apply to this discipline of infodemiology, which is not just useful for the current pandemic that we're in, but really has a lot of applications. And to your point about the Spanish flu, and uh, I think history really might not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And so concerns about <laughs> vaccines, for example, have been around ever since there was the first inoculation you know, over 120 years ago. And so um, I think, unfortunately, for those who work in um, vaccine development, and acceptance globally, we've been dealing with issues of people's trust and credibility, um, acceptance of vaccines, um, acceptance um, of you know health information, and uh, you know encouraging behaviors that are going to protect children from vaccine preventable diseases. So unfortunately, we we've, we've been to this rodeo a few times, and I think this is why a lot of the researchers who came to this conference come from an immunization background. But what I really wanted to make the point on this slide is is that if we want uh, our public health authorities around the world to take the work of infodemiology seriously, we need to speak in the language of public health, which is epidemiology. And now it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match. Um, you know, when we talk about managing epidemics, we can talk about managing infodemics. Um, when we talk about uh, surveillance, it has a very specific meaning for an epidemiologist. It means something very different to a journalist, right? It means something very different to someone who works in digital health. Um, and so we just want to understand that even the words we use to describe this can be quite different. Um, and, and again, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match, but when we think about virus uh, or pathogen and, ep and epidemiology, we can think about narratives. It's not just individual pieces of information, but the stories they tell and the type of chain reactions they can set off in terms of people continuing to disseminate information and misinformation. And then, of course, we talk about disease and distrust. Um, and, you know, the people that you trust, those are the ones that you want to, you know, spread information to, even unwittingly, if it's um, misinformation. And that mm -hmm. can have an impact on their behavior. And ultimately, interventions. You know, you really can't end any kind of outbreak without behavior change. There's no such thing as ending an epidemic with a purely medical intervention. People have right. to change their behaviors, whatever that is, whether that's taking a full course of antibiotics or getting immunized or, uh, you know, changing the, the environment. Um, uh, so it really, when we get at that intersection between epidemiology and epidemiology is that ultimately we want to end at behavior change. Um, and so what we want to also think about is that depending on where your country is in this epi curve um, in the current pandemic, uh, you will have different kinds of information and misinformation, and you'll have different kinds of responses needed. And so this is not a static, uh, this is not a static system. You know, this is this is an ongoing process, and we really need to be adaptable. And I think this is something that many health authorities and ministries of health around the world are struggling with. How do you keep up with a virus that's been that spreads so fast? And then how do you keep up with the misinformation, which seems to spread even faster? Yeah, for uh, sure. Uh, if you could hold on a second, I want to bring in Carl um, because he's an epidemiologist. And I know not everything fits that model, uh, but because we're humans and there's all these weird extra layers. But Carl, you've, you're like an epidemiologist uh, looking at the, the biology and statistics of this epidemic, but also you've been deeply dug in in the communication space trying to 
uh, call bullshit <laughs> to use an expression right. from your book. Um, so, so, and I don't want to impede the flow of the conversation, the slides too much, but maybe there's a quick thought here or two. And, and, uh, and let's there, we're having a little bit of a breakup with your signal. Um, so, um, try, I guess speak a little slower and see if we can work through that digital yeah. slowdown. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I think that these are, um, you know, these are useful metaphors uh, for thinking about the spread of, you know, disinformation across any space, whether we're, uh, you know, whether whether it's a, around uh, epidemiology and disease and public health or anything else, you know, political sphere or, or anything else like that. Obviously, there are uh, you know, a set of parallels that uh, that that hold up pretty well. Uh, my own you know, history of, uh, of of working on this and 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 sort of moving into uh, um, into thinking about uh, the spread of disinformation was uh, was working on epidemiology, working you know going from um, you know thinking about the evolution of emerging infectious diseases to starting to think about spread on networks to working out a lot of the mathematics of network um, of dynamics of flow on networks, which leads you very naturally into thinking about how information flows on networks. Uh, then you start to see the whole way that everything's getting misused on social media um, and the way that social, you know, uh, social media uh, amplifies uh, what's shocking and what's striking um, and amplifies various kinds of uh, identity signaling rather than amplifying what's true and also the way that it leaves these vulnerabilities to outside attacks. And so, um, you know, that combination of observations sort of linking up with uh, with the sort of mathematics that's being developed around uh, around uh, around network epidemiology and and uh, you know, some of the work that was done with respect to uh, uh, you know vulnerability in terms of uh, you know bioterror threats and this kind of thing all of this um, you know uh, has the obvious extensions and then you know on the other hand um, one wants to be and I think you're very well aware of this a little careful about not pushing that metaphor too far um, so that uh, one's very very uh, attuned to the things that are specific about uh, about fighting misinformation and disinformation online um, and where where the analogies don't necessarily hold as closely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that I think that came out during the conference for sure. Um, uh, yes. Let, let's uh, bring this back in. And Mar Marin, um, you know, as a journalist, you're immersed in this environment. You're teaching journalists how to deal with not not only the basics of biology of the virus and 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 the epidemiological questions and how to cover that, and you're doing this to journalists who are in newsrooms that are collapsing. This, so this, that adds can, yet another element, right? <clears throat> so like the capacity question. Yeah, we can talk about this more. But uh, I spent the month of May teaching a MOOC on the pandemic, a massive open online course for journalists around the world. There were about 9,000 participants from 160 countries. And I just recently, so misinformation and disinformation and combating that was a really significant part of what we were talking about. And since uh, the course has been over, as, as you're showing, it's now a self-directed course. It's no longer, uh, it no longer has live discussions and so forth, but it's still available in a number of languages. Um, Fantastic. I asked my former students uh, just this week, what, what's your situation? Has any of this gotten better? And I ha got back a cascade of responses about how challenging they're finding it to, to combat misinformation and disinformation. And the reason it's so hard is because in so many of their countries, and there's an eerie echo to the United States here, is they are saying, uh, that the official information that is coming from the you know, from the federal level or from our public health authorities is partial or late or demonstrably incorrect, and that creates an information vacuum into which bad information moves really fast. Um, it's a you know to 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 put an epidemiological lens on that. It is leaving people vulnerable to infection, uh, and hmm. it's incredibly dismaying to see. Wow. Yeah, that I'm going to get back to the slides and and and, I, and again, this came out and I think in the meeting I heard in the prelude at least to it there were discussions about this question of how do you fill the gap, like if that if that reliable information from reliable sources isn't able to readily be available, then it's all just waiting there like some kind of pressure. It's like being inside a balloon that's pressing in on you. So, Liz, can you kind of take us back mm -hmm. to the thinking and and solution space? 
Absolutely. And it's uh, it's really nice to hear um, from Aaron and from Carl, because I think a lot of the issues that they raised were quite common um, uh, themes in the conference as well. And so what we really ended up doing is we brought together um, over uh, 50 scientists and researchers from around the world from many, many different fields uh, and to really to define in this new field. And when I mean define, I mean even developing a glossary of common terms or even the same terms that might mean different things to different people. Because we started from this recognition that infodemic management or infodemiology is not a communications problem. It is not a public health discipline. It cannot be solved with just a nice fancy social media dashboard. This is a very, very complex problem that requires many different perspectives. And so you can actually see on the right, uh, this is my favorite analogy about, you know, we all know the story about the blind men touching the elephant. And the difference for this conference is that, you know, we have all these blindfolded people from different fields of health. And before they might have just been reporting back in their language back to folks in their fields about how they understand this elephant. Um, but what we had that was different for this conference is that we got everyone on a conference call over uh, several weeks for over these uh, several sprints. And we had them compare notes and we had them discuss and talk across fields. Um, and we really had everybody from physicists to behavioral scientists to uh, you know user experience and designers to people who think deeply about um, you know, digital technology and health um, and in and, and marketing. And it was just a huge range of, of experiences and, and backgrounds from, from, I think it was over 30 countries. And so we really had um, diversity geographically, diversity across uh, the disciplines. So I think over 20 disciplines in total were represented. Um, and really what we wanted them to do is get, have them, have the space, see the space to them for them to talk and to kind of work through, uh, you know, these key areas. And one is the information environment, how mis how information and misinformation spreads, how information affects populations and intervention development. And, uh, you know, what what is it that we wanted at the end of this entire process was really for them to identify and prioritize key areas of research that will really help us now and not five years from now in terms of doing a better job of, of responding to the current pandemic. Um, you know, there's a critical need identified that we need a better job, better tools, better approaches, a better evidence base to inform how we're supposed to be addressing information and misinformation. And I really want to clarify that people often assume two things when they hear infodemic. They think digital. And the thing is, there are many communities, especially at risk and vulnerable communities that are offline, un unnetworked, um, and or they're on hidden networks. And if we only assume that um, infodemic happens in digital spaces, there's a huge chunk of the population that's missing out. And we're not understanding uh, the narratives that they're exposed to, the misinformation that they're exposed to. And so we really need to make sure that whatever process by which we try to address the infodemic, we're collecting data from many different communities, both digital and analog. Um, and then, you know, I really wanted to emphasize here that uh, the fact that we had so many different disciplines meant there also, we were worried that people would be scared. How do you talk across the aisle? And, you know, I would be talking to a colleague in Indonesia and she is um, a journalism and media literacy professor. And when I had said, you know, we are on the list, to, you're invited to come. She's like, this is so exciting. I'm really excited. But what do you mean? I don't know how to talk to a mathematician. I don't know anything about mm -hmm. math. You know, she was genuinely freaked out about the idea of reaching across the aisle. And it's like, look, the mathematician is probably just as scared of you as you're scared of him in terms of like trying to talk in a common language. So we really had people lean into the discomfort and it worked surprisingly successfully. Um, and we're also really happy to put report is actually higher than 52% female. We ended up, I think, in total 56% female for representation. So we really wanted to have this diversity. But where did we end up? And that's really what comes next. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to build this research agenda globally, um, because this is just the first step of a much longer process. Right. And the other, just I want to just stop briefly on that question of the uh, sort of not online, not assuming this is all the noise online. Uh, Heidi Heidi Larson from the Vaccine Confidence Project was on here a week or two ago making the same point and noting, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and other regions like that, where you get these rumors floating around they get well. Radio was a big pl player in the Rwandan genocide, for example. So, it, it, these mm -hmm. media—it's—it's it's the practices in media, I think, more than the online environment that can be uh, either for better or worse. I think fairly early on in the pandemic, there was a really significant, uh, and I should have pulled some links up in advance. Sorry, but there was a really significant problem with WhatsApp groups, particularly in India and Pakistan. Um, 
uh, circulating, uh, you know, just in incredible rumors of misinformation. Of course, those have also been used to stir up political unrest as well uh, in those settings. Um, I mean, I live in Atlanta. I, I live probably about two miles from Elizabeth's office when she's in the office. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the city of Atlanta, we of course are in the hotspot of Georgia, is, um, it is communicating with everyone by SMS to be sure that if people are 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 mobile only if they're you know if they're if they're not at work computers if they are uh, are in a lower resourced household that doesn't have a good online access they still are being directed to the city's both mandates and resources for combating the pandemic in the lowest bandwidth way that the city can manage this is true i'll put up some of the links later if i can uh, this is these are really important points so so then and it's i guess this is like with climate change and the Anthropocene itself, this human era, we're sort of like designing an automobile even while we're driving it going 50 miles an hour and, and careening a little bit into the guardrails, if not off the cliff. So, so whether it's climate or the other emerging risks we face, um, as you were saying here, I guess one of the important messages is you're designing for now. What can we do now? And also trying to build the road ahead <laughs> or design a new guardrail or the like. Carl, um, as a communicative epidemiologist, and this is, I think, one of the issues with this entire arena. It's very easy to get so paralyzed by the by the scale and the dimensions of it. How do you actually? I'll ask each of you, maybe Carl first. How do you compartmentalize? How do you create that sense of order in the to do list when the issues have all those layers? The now layer. The what do we do next it's layer? Uh, it, you know, I don't think I've been very good at it necessarily. You know, I certainly, I, as the, as the, and my priorities are shifting as, as things go as, as um, the, you know, in, in January, I was really tracking misinformation and disinformation around a, um, around a possible emerging new uh, virus that uh, I thought was, you know, a, a threat, but certainly not all that likely to upend our lives the way that it had, um, you know, by, by late February, that was changing a lot. Um, and I started to shift my, uh, my my focus to uh, you know away from the sort of uh, you know trying to use this as a as a test bed to understand the way that misinformation flows and the way that uh, the way that disinformation can be injected into a social network and shifting my focus from that to uh, you know trying to communicate with people about what was actually going on with uh, with the pandemic what was happening what to expect um, and you know balancing my time and I and I'm still you know, attempting to do this I'm trying to balance my time about 50 percent between uh, between sort of you know public communication around uh, um, around the epidemiology of COVID, and then uh, and then sort of basic uh, you know mathematical epidemiology research really focused around testing and the efficacy of testing and and uh, the sort of logistics of testing plans and so on and so you know I think both things are really important. I mean, obviously, we need to work out uh, all of the the uh, you know mathematical epidemiology and all of that, um, but at the same time, uh, you're doing public communication around public health is doing public health because that is. Uh, essential to get the uh the you know sort of uh people in the public willing to engage in the sorts of painful and 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 uh difficult measures that we're asking everyone to take and if we don't explain clearly what is going on and why we need to you know why this is important um then you, you have no chance of being able to halt a epidemic with uh, these sort of non-pharmaceutical interventions that we're trying to use that's such an important point that doing public communication around public health is doing public health. And then having, as they say, the public part of public health is such a, an opportunity and a challenge generally. You know, how do you... It's interesting. I think it, it may be something that we'll have to do some soul searching about in, in the academy after all of this is over. It's still certainly not rewarded in terms of a, 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 you know, a career path for people as academic researchers. I mean, this has been a definitely a chance for people to, uh, you know, who, who want to do strictly the research to, um, you know, publish a large number of high profile papers very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and so there are people on that track. And then there are uh, people that are doing a lot of public communication. Because all I can say is it's a nice argument for tenure is that uh, <laughs> one certainly doesn't have to worry about, uh, uh, about one's CV. And Matt Marin, actually, could you just Tell us briefly about how that course evolved. How were you able, in the space of 
a few months or weeks to design a course. Yeah, I mean, your, your so, main job is a journalist, right? An yes, author. right. I did not give up being a journalist. Yeah, so I have a number of overlapping jobs. I'm, you know, I'm a contributor for Wired. I write for major magazines and I write right. about scary diseases. And I have been writing <clears throat> about the possibility of a pandemic coming probably since covering H5N1 flu in Hong Kong in 1997. So, uh, I've been thinking about this issue and, and about models of what we might do for a very long time. And I have to say in all of the, the sort of models I considered and all the warnings that I thought I helped elevate, I never imagined that we would be in a situation like the one we're here, we are in now in the United States where our, uh, sorry Elizabeth, but our public health authorities are, are absent from the stage, whether they are, are um, doing that willingly or being forced off the stage and our the top level of our political um, of our administration is essentially hostile to public health. It's a stunning experience. It kind is hard to keep your spirits it, up. It's the one thing we never and it really comes into the core of dealing sorry, sorry to jump in. It's absolutely at the core of the epidemiology problem in the US, unfortunately. And we that's a sort of elephant in the room that we can't right. ignore is that is that hostility. <laughs> And it was, you know, I spent the 20 aughts working on pandemic planning um, around uh, around H5N1 and, and other uh, such diseases. And while there was a lot of uh, concern about and, and, and disagreement about the degree to which, uh, you know, government versus uh, free market solutions should be used to develop the capacity and infrastructure, it was completely clear at the time, or at least we certainly seemed completely clear at the time that if anything, you know, if, if this ever hit, we'd all be on the same page and it would just be a matter of, you know, getting the science out there and stopping it. And so this has been really striking. Uh, right. We've gone from the George Bush White House writing the first pandemic influenza strategy to the Obama White House writing the first ever national strategy to combat antibiotic resistance to now essentially, well, you're on your own. Good luck. Yeah. But I want to answer the question about the course because this, because there's an important tie to what we're saying. So all credit for this goes to um, the Knight Foundation, the philanthropy, and the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas, which is based at the University of Texas, and which does asynchronous, um, both sort of academic and peer-to-peer -peer instruction for journalists all around the world, with a focus mostly on the Americas, so in Spanish and Portuguese. And they uh, reached out to me, I think it was in April, and said, we'd really like to do a course on doing journalism in the pandemic. And we need to do it really quickly because th this pandemic is happening right now. And could you please, um, uh, could you create it for us? Knock yourself out. <laughs> if you, yeah. if you um, uh, scroll down a little further, these are the most current courses, but I think it should be further oh, down there. Um, and yeah, yeah. So in the self-directed courses, so it's come off the fir first okay. page. So um, this is challenging because the, the, the problem of this pandemic journalistically has been that this is the only story in the world right now. And right. As, as much as people want us to, con and, and I think this is an appropriate critique, to want us to continue to be paying attention to climate change. Um, climate, cha even, climate change, the biggest story of our times is falling down below this. As, and, yeah. and this means that journalists of all types who previously might've covered in the US context, cops and courts, or food, or transportation, or design, or technology are all now in this story with very different amounts of background. And some degree of background is necessary in order to cover this intelligently and at a level that your audience, wherever they are, is going to understand. So the point of this course was to get journalists of all experiences in all types of outlets, um, newsletters, newsrooms, uh, radio producers, audio producers, up to speed on the basics of what they needed to know, both in the moments we did it. We did a unit on um, on the history of past pandemics and what the lessons were. We did sort of the pandemic right now. We did misinformation and disinformation and the socioeconomic implications of this and sort of what we, how we move into a kind of harm reduction mode and think about how we live some portion of the rest of our lives with this. Mm -hmm. And as I said, almost 9,000 students, 160 countries, um, uh, we set up discussion boards for them. We delivered the content in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. It's still, it's subsequently self-directed, been uh, also translated, I think, into Russian, Arabic, Mandarin, and uh, there may be another, maybe Turkish 
Um, this was a, the translation support was provided. I should make, declare our, our um, conflicts here was a, pr provided by the WHO and the United Nations Development Program and UNESCO. So we got some funding from them to make sure that this was spread around the world. The astonishing thing to me, once people got past the basics of having to understand or having to understand the basics of epidemiology and disease transmission is how similar the issues were across societies. And they were overwhelmingly issues of bad information at the official level getting in the way of a coherent response. Um, as I said, I asked some of my students last night, uh, students and the participants in the course, what's going on? Um, a, a journalist from Peru said they had just, I think it was going to be yesterday, the Congress had um, arranged a, a, an, an appearance by a speaker who's pro-hydroxychloroquine, and it took massive public outcry to make them to back down. A uh, very similar thing is happening in Brazil, of course, where the Brazilian president has been a huge booster of hydroxychloroquine. Um, a, a, a journalist from, from Argentina said to me, the, um, the breeding ground for fake news is due to the need for information from the community and suspicion or delay of the state in providing official information. In many occasions, the announcements are bombastic, but scarce of, this is Google Translate, sorry, I don't speak Spanish, uh, but scarce of precise data. And in the absence of precision, false news arises. I mean, that's just a perfect statement of what journalists are, are facing around the world with very few tools to combat it. Because as you said, Andy, you know, journalism as a business model has been collapsing. So we, and it continues to collapse because of the lack of revenue, uh, because of the shutdowns of society, the lack of advertising. Um, and so precisely at the moment when we need journalism the most to, to help untangle this infodemic um, in order for people to be the best protected and for countries to mount a coherent response, we are at the, the lowest moment, both in terms of trustworthy information and in terms of funding the people who can help get the trustworthy information to the public. Marin, can I just ask a question or to open it up to anybody really, but I'm really, I'm really struck by the fact, you know, you also, mentioned that you know you sort of hadn't expected us to be here in terms of having official sources as uh, as you know major purveyors of misinformation during this crisis and you also just mentioned that it's not just a u.s uh, phenomenon but it seems to be uh global uh, how did we not see this coming i i how did why did why did i not realize what why did, you know do you have any sense of of what what happened? I mean, is, are things fundamentally different in 2020 than they were in in 2005? Or you yeah. know, with this, I mean, I think that's a really good question, and I think we all have to fault ourselves, right? That um, that that we that are that we shouldn't have just had a null hypothesis, maybe that nothing would be different, but that we actually should have had a negative hypothesis. Um, that that. I, Maybe this is a unique set of circumstances that we have this combination, this combination of a White House backed by, you know, a, a White House that's hostile to public health, backed by a Congress that doesn't seem willing, at least in the Senate, to rein that White House in, and uh, a weaponized social media environment, which I'm sure you know much more about, Carl, than I do. Um, that, that, you know, in, in 2009, um, when the H1N1 flu be, uh, began to spread, that's really our last pandemic. Fortunately, it wasn't that deadly a one, though it was an, an enormous one. Um, you know, uh, Facebook was what three years old. Twitter was two years old. So while there, there, there certainly was, there were forms of social media, and there were plenty of people talking on, um, you know, on on email and and in the whatever the platforms were that we used before right, Twitter and right. Facebook, they just didn't have that that force multiplier. And certainly in, in 1997 and 2003, when we were dealing with H5N1, which you and I have in common, you know, we didn't have any of those. The, the, the most that people had to kind of womp up concern were, uh, was email and bulletin boards and the sort of walled garden um, uh, internet uh, sites yeah. and, uh, and, and pretty low-fi SMS. So we've never right. had the, the, in my observation, we've, we've never had the, the complete the confounder of social media exerting as much force as it does now. 
Maybe to, uh, I, to uh, add a, uh, another perspective from the immunization side, um, again, I think folks who work in immunization demand have been unfortunately dealing uh, with misinformation and infodemic um, way before 2020. Um, one of the uh, keynote speakers during the conference um, was a gentleman named Rustam Haidarov, who was uh, speaking from UNICEF headquarters about the Peshawar incident. And the Peshawar incident actually was um, um, a case study that Claire Wardle, who was from First Draft, she actually covered it uh, um, as well, it was one of your previous uh, guests, Sandy, um, from a journalistic perspective. But I think it is a, a, a key moment of like the infodemic before 2020, where uh, in, in about a year ago, in Peshawar, uh, Pakistan, there was a, an oral poliovirus uh, immunization campaign, and a video was circulating on WhatsApp that uh, purported to show children receiving um, this vaccine and then falling down and having seizures. And um, there was a rumor that the vaccine had been poisoned, and the previous day had been the day where you know tens of thousands of children had been immunized. And so, what did parents do when they came across this? They frantically took, grabbed their children, and rushed to the closest health facility and hospital. They burned down hospitals. You know, we had uh, police officers were stabbed, and uh, the entire government was paralyzed in terms of responding officially. And of course, all of this was timed when the only official spokesperson from the the government of Pakistan that was could have gone on record to talk about out what was happening and how they were responding, he happened to be out of the area. And so this just really to highlight that um, credibility in government is not is not an end state. It's something that needs to be built over time. And credibility and trust in health authorities needs to be built over time. Um, and I think in that instance, it really highlighted, you know, that there's Tinder, that if you have lack of trust um, in health authorities and lack of trust in the health system, um, you know, it doesn't take much uh, to really get uh, that 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 panic to a point where people end up jumping the digital divide of what they see on their WhatsApp and then actually doing something in the, in the real world that um, has a negative um, health impact. And so that online offline gap of how does exposure to misinformation translate to offline behavior, uh, particularly ones that are damaging, is something that's extremely concerning for immunization programs. Uh, when you have such a, a, a massive uh, fear-based reaction uh, in a place like Peshawar that has done damage to the immunization program, not just for polio, but for all other vaccines that children receive in this area. And it's in its reputational damage that the, the country is going to have to work to do for years to come. And that's the most concerning is not just the, the initial incident, but the fact that this has been built on previous incidents and future incidents that really just undermine uh, parents and caregivers' confidence in vaccines and in the health system. And so this is not new. I think um, there's been um, many instances where um, promises have been broken and values have been violated. And when that happens, um, of course, people are going to fear uh, fear what is coming and they're going to seek for information from different places. And if they're not getting what they need, um, that's being you know really clearly and articul articulated by health authorities uh, in a timely manner, that's when things go south. Um, if anybody's interested in learning how CDC does this, I would look up CERC, which is Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication. So literally, CDC wrote the book on how do you talk to the public in times of crisis. And so there's some really basic principles that we can consider. And I think the first three are the most important, which is be first, be right, be credible. And the thing is, is that you can't be credible in the middle of a crisis if you haven't worked to build your credibility up until that point. Um, you know, I've seen I've seen guidance where it says, you know, reach out to journalists to to speak to them about the importance of, you know, covering this health issue uh, in, in an accurate manner. And it's like, OK, dude, when th things have hit the fan, that is not the time to be building relationships with journalists. That is not the time to be building credibility. The credibility is what you carried with you up until this moment. And that is what you're hoping that people will rely on. And that's why they will listen to you when you're speaking on behalf of a, of a health agency. And you're trying to give advice on what people need to do to protect themselves and their families. And what's encouraging about what you just said is that that's a general principle. When I talk to scientists about or institutions like the Earth Institute or wherever, if you're not developing a regular non-deadline relationship with journalists or, or communities, you know, open house, um, virtual or otherwise, uh, then when, as you say, when things go sour, that that's the last time you want to be starting from scratch on that. And that, that point you made about the erosion of trust having this enduring shadow is a very disturbing part of where we're at right now, because mm -hmm. that's been wrecked, basically. And, you know, whoever points a finger at whoever, there's been this real, the damage that's been done is probably going to be very hard to uh, reverse uh, anytime soon, unless everyone works really hard in novel ways. Well, a problem with this, and Elizabeth was referencing this, is that, you know, behind, there, there may be 
you know, disinformation and fake campaigns like the Peshawar inst incident, sorry. But, you know, the, the CIA really did use a polio vaccination campaign as a cover to try to get Osama bin Laden. You know, the Trovan uh, vaccine trial really did happen in Nigeria, the basis of the, the, the novel, you know, The Constant Gardener. Um, the, the Tuskegee uh, study on untreated syphilis really did happen in the United States. There were all these major actions that created enduring distrust particularly, or, but not only around vaccines, that um, that had cast an incredibly long shadow. I mean, I, there, there are people here in Atlanta, you know, the Tuskegee was one state over, who still talk about the Tuskegee trial and, and why therefore American medicine should not be trusted to take care of African Americans. Right. So there's a lot of work to be done is where, now I'm gonna share this, go back to the slides so we can, uh get back to some of the points you were making uh, this out of the meeting. Um, hold on a second here. So, uh, you know, really, what are we doing that's coming down the turnpike? Um, so this research agenda um, really uh, has been kind of focused around these uh, five streams um, that was that that kind of fits along that epi curve about thinking about um, data, uh, data sources, data triangulation metrics um, in terms of defining um, that that online offline gap uh, between exposure to misinformation offline um, and, and offline behavior. Um, but this is just the beginning. So we have kind of a broad strokes draft public health agenda. Um, um, as a starting point. And the next step will be to get um, a, a wider um, set of feedback from a wider set of scientific stakeholders beyond those who attended the conference. Um, and then, of course, develop this review of evidence for the five weeks terms of the agenda, which also links to um, a, a joint call for infodemiology uh, papers. Uh, we just had the first discussion this morning with six different journals. Um, and uh, it's going to be something that will be coming out in the next few weeks about really setting a, um, a several series of um, journal articles and uh, special issues around February um, to really talk about the state of the infodemic and the latest in infodemiology research and to really advance this draft public health research agenda further. Um, and now we have this group of very excited people who really want to collaborate and they want to work in this field and they and they really can see their applicability of, um, you know, their, their particular background as it relates to our current pandemic. And so we're going to try to develop this community of research and practice to really bring them together um, for tools and resources and then um, really track the implementation of the agenda. Um, but, you know, we kind of joke that an infodemiologist is a unicorn. No country on earth has an infodemiologist on staff. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's not something that's on people's resumes. And because we recognize that it requires many different skill sets, you need to not just have, you know, epi skills, but data skills, communication skills, um, understanding behavioral science and user experience and design, that most of those skills don't live in one human. And so we joke, not only, we can't find these unicorns necessarily, so we'll have to build them. So what would a unicorn factory look like? How do we build <laughs> Build unicorns that have this skill set that can support uh, ministries of health around the world to do a better job of handling the infodemic, um, and I think that will be kind of the next hurdle that we that we'll want to cross because it, this is where this is not going to be the only infodemic coming our way. Um, I unfortunately anticipate that we'll have more infodemics coming our way, and it will have twin infodemics. When you have so many children who are not immunized for so long, you're going to start seeing outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases. We've already started to see this. You know, when you have dozens and dozens of campaigns of uh, for immunization that's supposed to immunize tens of millions of children, they've been halted or delayed because of COVID nineteen. It's only a matter of time before we start seeing outbreaks of measles um, and outbreaks of diphtheria and other vaccine preventable diseases. And then of course, all the misinformation that can accompany that as well. So it's it's something that we we really have a deadline. We The world cannot wait for us to get this, to get this together. And so I, I really look forward to um, th thinking through what do we do next? How do we build these unicorn factories? How do we, how do we uh, uh, train people up on these skills? And, and how do we make health authorities and ministries of health aware that this is a really important resource they need to invest in? I think anybody who's a communicator knows that communications is the fifth wheel. You know, you only take it out when you really need it. It's the spare tire. Um, it's not heavily invested in and um, it's not taken seriously until things go wrong. Then suddenly communications becomes important. Sure. But again, this is this is far more than just communications. It's far more than a social media uh, dashboard. This really requires an entirely new set of skills combined together in interesting ways. Yeah, Lori Garrett made that point on, on our broadcast, um, God, it was way back. She did a Lancet commentary where she got at this point of re resources. And she said, 
we're now in a crisis, uh, stock markets, everything is going to hell. Social media companies like Facebook, Google, WeChat, blah, 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 Instagram devoting some resources, but these social media platforms remain packed with anti-science and conspiracy claims. And the institutions, whether it's WHO, CDC, uh, the, the capacity to monitor, understand the system. I think you had 14 or 15 people in your, in your group there. I, I think there are five people total at WHO Maybe I think I saw it was like 12, if you really count consultants who are managing this thing affecting 7.8 billion people on the planet, the information environment. As you say, the, we are not even close to being under invested in this, let alone invested in it. Carl, I don't know. And Marin, what do you think about that? Well, I, 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 I mean, that's, that, that seems right. There's something that occurs to me as I'm you know, hearing about what, you know, what it takes to build infodemiologists and stuff like this. And I'm curious, Elizabeth, if you've thought at all about uh, um, how, do, how, do you, uh, how do you use this? How, how do you, you know, what distinguishes this from uh, building propaganda experts who you just hope happen to happen to use it for good? That's a good question. Um, I would say primarily people who work in propaganda are focused on communications. But, you know, we need people who have computational mathematical skills. We need people who have behavioral science skills. And the, 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 I think the two major parts of emphasis here is we need to build the science and we need to build capacity countries, particularly low and middle income countries to do a better job handling this, not just for the current pandemic, but for any health issue where you're trying to change behaviors and where there's misinformation that threatens that uptake of those healthy behaviors. And so, you know, I think it is, it is an important question, like how do we make sure that we're building uh, skill sets that are useful and are for the good um, and really help uh, further public health? But, you know, it's think about it when you, when you think about the pharmaceutical industry, every single time a new drug is launched, think about the marketing uh, money that's poured into into getting the word out about how this new fantastic drug can solve problem X. Uh, it, there's not a similar amount of investment on the public health side in terms of uh, marketing uh, a particular behavior that you want people to have. And so, yeah. you know, I think that there's a little bit of um, as uh, asymmetrical uh, um resource allocation in terms of where do we pour money into to be able to change people's behaviors in a way where they feel empowered in their own health and decision making. I wouldn't underestimate the amount of effort that's gone into the uh, sort of the mathematics and social physics and so forth on the side of people uh, investing in propaganda. I think that state sponsored actors have spent a lot of time doing, you know, careful social network analysis and probing the vulnerabilities um, with with smaller scale experiments. So uh, I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I, I would conjecture, I don't have as hard of evidence as I would like that, uh, that that science is actually probably fairly advanced as well. Well, yeah, and I had uh, Rene DeResta from Stanford on here um, just a week or so ago talking about um, how pandemic and these other very sophisticated propaganda tools, uh, whether your agenda is anti-vaccine or you know, if, whatever your agenda is, the capacity there is pretty sophisticated. And and the other thing that I learned, it, it took me way too long as a journalist covering climate change. So I, write, I was writing about climate change for 20 years before I interviewed a social scientist. I'd won all these prizes, you know, written two or three books. And 2006 was the first time I interviewed a social scientist about global warming. And it was like, oh my God, <laughs> there was this whole morass of work that, you know, all the biases, confirmation bias, optimism bias, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one thing that led me progressively away from full-time journalism because I realized, well, if I'm just going to be putting out a story, really cool stories with great infographics for the rest of my life, is that enough? And so that's that's what leads me to your course, Carl. And like, you know, I think it's still wishful thinking, given what I know about what I've learned about the social scientists to think social sciences to think we can make reality cool. Cool being the operative word, you have to want it, whatever your perspective here. But having this course. The book is coming out, as you said, next week. Um, the curriculum, the syllabus for the course is online and free. And it's like, I, I keep writing and pointing people to that. And I think if we can stimulate in kids, I would like to think you could build a culture where, you know, you don't want to be fooled. Do you want to be called out as a wrong if you're young? I think there's some kind of basic striving not to be wrong. But there's also, I know, a lot of resistance to people who are like finger waggers. You're wrong. <laughs> Yeah, right. We don't want to be, I mean, we write about this a little bit in the book. I mean, we, you know, we definitely don't want to create a generation of, uh, of, you know, well, actually guys that can, you know, get on the internet. <laughs> well, everybody. We actually talk about how to, you know, how to avoid, 
how to tell if that's what you're doing and and so on. Oh, I'd like to um, to take that that part of the course. Yeah, so the uh, but but you know in any case, I mean we, we we do talk a lot about the you know about sort of uh, uh, you know your your responsibility to to um, you know call bullshit in a productive and and uh, and, and c- constructive way, and that and that means a lot of the time not speaking up around certain kinds of things and, and, and really choosing your battles. Uh, but, you know, in terms of like making it cool and all of that, I mean, the, um, you know, we've been, you know, so the, the, the curriculum, we, we, we put the syllabus up three years ago. It's, you know, pieces of it or the whole thing are taught at you know, well over a hundred schools around the, around the world now. Um, and we've been piloting it in a bunch of high schools and uh, it goes so well in high schools because there's nothing that, you know, 15, 16 year olds, 15, 16 year olds, you know, they, they know that adults are full of shit and uh, there's nothing they like more than being able to call it out um, and, you know, spot it, call it out and kind of have the ability to, you know, not only say, you know, oh, the adults are full of shit, but to show exactly why and to, and to be able to explain that. And, and it's just been a you know delight to see how excited the students get and so it sort of combines you know what we're doing is combining uh uh especially at that level especially at the high school level a lot of uh, basic media literacy with um with uh you know the course is really about about the way that quantitative information can be used to mislead people and so we're definitely trying to get people thinking about data and you know how do you think about data visualizations how do you interpret those you know did you realize that a data designer can uh, you know can can change the way you feel about data without actually fudging the data and, and, and bringing all of that to light. But uh, especially as we move into the high school direction, it's, you know, so much of it is really just about helping people understand what trusted sources are and, and all of that, which I think is going to be, you know, we talk about solutions and what we can do now. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a bit of a long game solution, but you know, this is what I decided uh, three years ago was that one of the most important things we could do was was really invest as educators in uh, in creating a informed public and so our center for the informed public um, that was able to see through a lot of this because your your sort of your approach is you know you you can you can take a tech approach to you know fake news and, and misinformation and so on. I'm really skeptical about you know whether uh, you know AI can filter out the the fake news. Ad- adversarial AI can get in the way. You can take a regulatory approach. Um, and I'm really, you know, I'm a really strong supporter of very broad, uh, broadly interpreted First Amendment rights. So I'm not very happy there. And that leaves the sort of the third leg of the stool. And the only one that we can really stand on firmly, I think, is, is education. Um, so anyway, that's. Well, and, and by the way, um, in another arena, I've done two or three sessions in the last month or so that focus on right now we are teachers are freaked out about not they're freaked out about going to the classroom again. That's yeah. But, but they're also freaked out about another semester or two or year of high school or, or secondary school online. And so how do you make screen learning engaging is a key opportunity and headache. Uh, There's a group called earthrise.education that's got kids. They were doing this in lockdown. They were searching for, uh, Amazon rainforest uh, gold mining in Indian reserves uh, using oh, wow. satellite images. And they found that that has a lot of pull. So instead of Zoom being an oh my God thing, it's like suddenly got pull. This feels like a course that some course designers and, you know, this is this we're in that like solution space here the last five minutes. Uh, if I could convene mm-hmm. a few folks, I could see ways to fast track getting a, a really uh, agile, adaptive a curriculum that could go down the chain around this idea. Going you know, forward. definitely adapting it to the to the online setting would be fantastic. I mean, there was a uh, um, Saul Perlmutter and some of his colleagues ran a quite a remarkable meeting uh, last summer before we had any idea of you know what the world was going to be like now about uh, you know for people that were teaching this kind of critical reasoning. Um, course you know and and uh at, at the college level and it was amazing the degree of convergence that uh that a number of uh you know people you know teaching at berkeley and at uh, and at uh, columbia and other places had come to um in putting together these courses that didn't fit cleanly into individual disciplines but really tried to get students thinking critically and i think you know what the what 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 they shared in common was that so much of what we do in STEM teaching right now is we, we teach mechanics and, and we teach students to be you know good at, uh, at doing particular mechanical transformations or programming various things. And we don't teach them to do a lot of critical thinking. 
and um, and the way that you do in the humanities and such. And so, you know, one thing that I think makes the this kind of teaching very very engaging as well as, uh, as 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 very valuable, especially for people going into STEM, is that you are asked to do this critical thinking, and you're asked to bash ideas together, and you're asked to to challenge uh, the information that's out there. And I think you know one one could definitely you know do teaching uh, even at the high school level more like Gary Smith's econometrics class, where instead of being you know given uh, data and cookbooking it, you're given a set of bad statistics studies, and you right. take these apart and you and you look at what could have been done instead. Um, I'd love to see you know people who actually knew about curriculum development uh, um, take that I, on. I, I know a few, and I was so impressed. It was in March that Seamus Khan, who's the chairman of sociology at Columbia, here's a guy. You know, he's chairman of a department, tenured, doesn't have to mm -hmm. really do much <laughs> except you know the normal stuff. And almost over, in a few days, he and some colleagues created um, uh, it was youthremotelearning.com. They pulled together. Uh -huh. People were locked at home, you know, people who could teach were locked at home, kids were locked at home. And it was like this menu and calendar of, and it, almost instantaneously, here's some courses we can teach live to kids on that's this. Great. And that's the capacity, I think, so great right now. And so if we can convene around how to take that course and the findings from the infodemiology meeting in that yeah. space. And I actually, <laughs> Marin, you know, this relates to what you're trying to do. With <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I mean, Marin just taught 9,000 journalists around I the know. world, sort of the scales, you know, and so there's, I wish I had had your you course, were... access to your course, or I wish I'd, I mean, it was there, obviously, but I wish I'd known about it when I was designing my course uh, two months ago, because, huh. uh, and I'm going to be sure now that they, they know, because we have an ongoing Facebook group and a Telegram group and so forth, um, that they know about this, because they're crying out for resources. Great. Well, we should, yeah. um... and maybe even to, sorry. But I just wanted to link on to uh, this, what Carl and what Marin were saying. Um, you know, I think what it comes down to connecting the dots between the infodemiology conference and the idea of health literacy, media literacy, digital literacy. You know, I think historically, health authorities, what did they do? They printed posters, had jingles play on the radio and blasted stuff out very top down. And we know that's not sufficient. Right. <laughs> the world's only ever eradicated one disease in humans yeah. and that's smallpox. And you know that the, the approaches that we use to eradicate smallpox are not the same approaches we need to be using today. And so I also think we need to have a bottom up approach. And this came through very clearly um, in the infodemiology conference, like only through improving people's literacy to be able to detect misinformation, be able to address it and uh, do a better job of mitigating it at the personal level uh, is really the way I really think is the winning strategy in combination with a more coherent uh, uh, messaging from from the top down is very much the bottom up approach. How do we empower individuals and communities? And I think young people are the key here, right? Um, mm -hmm. To really be able to to stop misinformation at the source. Um, and there's a really great uh, Canadian organization that calls Kids Boost Immunity. And um, they do uh, an entire curriculum around vaccines and vaccine information that kids can take for quizzes online that are aligned with a Canadian uh, public health uh, course. But what's cool is that for every uh, correct answer on a quiz that uh, a kid submits, a vaccine is donated to UNICEF. And so kids do it because not only are they learning something and teachers do it in class because mm -hmm. it's aligned with the curriculum, but kids do it because they can feel good. And in the process, they're sneakily getting some health literacy and media literacy training. And so I think those are the kinds of innovative approaches we need to think about in the future. They really look at that individual level to be an ability to address misinformation. That's fantastic. Well, so we got to, I'll co compile some of these links. I'm going to try to write up a blog post for the State of the Planet blog at the Earth Institute to great. summarize some of the next steps here, because it's pretty clear there's an opportunity here. Uh, Marin, it was great that you could break away to do this. I want to do another session with your journalists. We will get them on. We can organize this. So we might have a little that. bit of a time zone problem. They might have to stay up late or get up early. But it would be amazing, I think, for people to hear firsthand what some of the journalists that participated in my course were dealing with. I mean, in places like, you know, Nepal and Mozambique right. and uh, uh, Ecuador and so forth. Uh, um, we think that the media is in bad shape in North America, but when I listen to what some of those participants yeah. were dealing with in, in you know, literally being physically assaulted for doing their jobs, um, it's astonishing. Well, this is great. Um, I um, there's lots to follow up, follow up on. I want to tell you, by the way, we're just for, uh, in early August. Um, here, we're going to launch uh, our first Spanish language versions of what I'm doing. Dale Willman, who does Resilience Media Workshop here now, is going to be doing uh, the first all Spanish uh, 
webcast. So we're, we can do these in different languages. We can do them at different times of day, depending on, you know, who should, who's listening or who needs to be listening. Thank you all for being here. I'm putting up here uh, on Sunday. You know, I do these four times a week for now. Um, we're doing another novelty. Uh, the first time we're doing a play reading live, uh, four or five actors in different homes in different places are going to be reading this amazing play. It's about the future of biology and a changed climate, the human species coming to an end as we know it and coming to a beginning. Uh, Karen Malpede is a very innovative eco-feminist playwright whose work I saw this, I saw this play in a tiny theater early in the year, and now we're going to read it out loud. Um, next Monday, we're doing a session on maps as stories with um, uh, uh, Don Wright from ESRI and um, a great scientist at Columbia. Wednesday, Jeff Sachs will be on to talk about how do you manage like five different crises at once. <laughs> He's running all kinds of things. He's the head of the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. Yeah. And on and on and on we go. So j.mp slash sustain what live is where I live these days. Thank you to Marin. Uh, uh, thank you to Liz Wilhelm from CDC and from the Infodemiology Conference. Thank you to Carl Bergstrom for, for calling bullshit online and in your course. And uh, thank you to the listeners um, and watchers. Please share this. Uh, I always like to end with a little boilerplate thing because um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Uh, Sustain What is a global online conversation identifying solutions to the complicated, shape-shifting, and epic challenges of humanity's great acceleration. That's what we've been on for the last half century or so. And now, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're in great pause mode. Where we go from here is a long journey. It involves a lot of innovation and collaboration. A prime focus is making sense of and getting the most out of the planet's fast forward information environment. It's the one Earth system changing faster than the actual environment we live in. And it's the one that's making us able to connect right now. Uh, this webcast is produced as part of my work building Columbia University's new Earth Institute initiative on communication and sustainability. As soon as we're done, share the link you've been watching on with friends and circles far and wide. Get in touch with ideas. Look at that little scrolling bar at the bottom. Sift back and you can find information on how to reach me. And uh, go forward, stay safe. Try to stay at least partially sane. Get some rest uh, when you're not on screen and um, come back. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.